and I have notified the Olympic Committee that with Soviet invading forces in Afghanistan, neither the American people nor I will support sending an Olympic team to Moscow. If America and the Olympic movement are great, they are great because they are both founded upon the same multicultural principles, inalienable rights, ideas of international cooperation, and on the idea that a person, or an athlete, can go as far in this life as their talent, their drive, and their hard work will take them, without government interference. Yet, in the case of the 1980 Moscow Olympic Games and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, political interests, many misunderstandings, and an unwillingness to listen to the Olympic movement resulted in a U.S. Olympic boycott policy that missed the common principles, that missed alternatives to the boycott, and that would have made a more powerful statement. A forgotten fact of history, however, is that the forceful statements about the American and Olympic issues that should have guided our response to the Soviet invasion and the Moscow Olympics were made, though not by the Carter administration. They were made by a small, courageous group of athletes led by a little-known African-American woman Olympian with an Olympian will named Anita de France. Far from being the unpatriotic athletes portrayed in the press, they said what the Carter administration should have been saying, and their actions have stood the test of time. This is the story of the courage and values that led Anita de France to challenge the Carter administration in the face of great opposition, the catalyst that she became, the history that she made, and the lessons and legacies of her challenge to the 1980 Olympic boycott. Anita de France, the great-great-granddaughter of a Louisiana plantation owner and a female servant, was born in Philadelphia in 1952. The great progress in civil rights, women's rights, and gender equality in sports during her school and college years helped to shape her every bit as much as the parents, Robert, and Anita de France, who taught her to work hard and be the best at everything she did. As she would later say, I stand on the shoulders of giants. In her second year in college, she joined the rowing team. Rowing was the noblest of sports, she said, everyone being a part of the effort. Graduating with a BA with honors, she entered law school. In 1976, she made the national rowing team and was the captain of the Olympic rowing team. She came home an Olympic champion with a bronze medal. She was elected as a delegate to the USOC House of Delegates and to the Executive and Administrative Committee. In 1977, she set her sights on the 1980 Moscow Olympics. Despite a demanding work schedule as an attorney, she began the rigorous training that would be required, and in 1979, with little money, she took leave of absence to train. And then, on December 27th of 1979, with the Olympic trials in sight, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Running for re-election and against the perception that he was a weak president unable to fix the country's problems, Carter chose to use the Olympics that were to be held that summer in Moscow as an easy and relatively inexpensive weapon. On January 20th of 1980, he wrote a letter to the president of the U.S. Olympic Committee, or USOC, saying that if the Soviets did not withdraw from Afghanistan within a month, they should urge the International Olympic Committee, or IOC, to transfer the games to another site or cancel them altogether. Should the IOC refuse, he said, the USOC should not participate. A few days later, the House and Senate passed resolutions supporting the president. Concerned by what she perceived to be a political decision made by people who did not understand the Olympics, who had not considered alternatives, and who were unaware of its implications, de France decided to act. As she later recalled in an interview with me, You can't just accept decisions. You have to understand the basis for the decision. And we had considered it well and concluded that it just had no relationship to the goal that it had hoped to make. I knew that it could not be right in our country to have our private activities taken that way. But we also have to be clear that the Olympic movement cannot be controlled by the governments. Why should we keep the athletes home? Do you think the, the military invasion in Afghanistan is going to stop? On January 28th, she spoke before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to stress the sacrifices that the athletes had made as private citizens. At their meeting on February 9th in Lake Placid, the IOC rejected President Carter's request, 
leaving an April 12th boycott vote by the USOC as Carter's last hope. On March 21st, the athletes and their elected representatives were invited to a meeting with the president at the White House. We understand, DeFrant said before the meeting, that we will be given an opportunity to ask questions and, and express views. It is very important that this is not just a showcase for the administration to say, this is the way things are. This, however, was exactly how things were. President Carter told the athletes that the U.S. would not participate in the Moscow Olympics. As she later recalled, I had hoped to present to the president an idea I think would have made the most dramatic statement of all, which would have been for one member of the U.S. team to march into open ceremonies holding the U.S. flag. Not being there meant we didn't say anything. And the fact that the administration did not have good information is really the cause for the boycott. Increasing the political and economic pressure, Carter sent a personal telegram to the April 12th USOC meeting, characterizing the vote as a national security matter. He dispatched Vice President Mondale to speak. As a delegate to the USOC House of Delegates, DeFrance delivered a powerful speech. Bringing the USOC members to cheers, she concluded her remarks by paraphrasing Benjamin Franklin. When the ballots were counted, two-thirds of the USOC members had voted in favor of the boycott. With no other options available, De France, along with 18 other athletes, a coach, and a USOC official, filed a suit against the USOC. They lost. Their appeal also lost. Her challenge to the Carter boycott triggered a flood of public controversy and personal criticism. She was called unpatriotic. She received hate mail. She was put under intense governmental scrutiny, and she was afraid to pick up the phone. Letters came to Princeton demanding they dismiss her. There was no going back once I got out there. It was scary, but also, I grew up in a family uh, where we were taught to stand up for what we believed in, to be willing to take the risk for what is right. As I knew it was risky, I was basically suing the White House, although the method was to sue the USOC for the right to go. I knew I had to be careful because I didn't want to destroy the Olympic movement by doing something that would turn off the American public. But I also needed to show the American public that we were people next door. So it was a very dangerous thing that I was doing, and I knew it, and I was worried about the other uh, appellants, and I was worried about the USOC. I knew I was risking my future, but I also believed I was right. This would be your trial by fire, showing courage in the face of great opposition and risking everything for something she believed in. It reflected her character and her Olympic will. She would be awarded the IOC's Olympic Order in Bronze, would become the first African American and the first American woman to serve on the IOC, the first female vice president of the IOC Executive Committee, and the first woman to run for the IOC presidency in its 106 year history. She is currently the president of the LA84 Foundation, has been awarded seven honorary law degrees, and was named one of the most powerful women in sports by the Sporting News nine times. And her legacy has already been huge. As an IOC member, she helped establish and chaired the IOC's Women in Sports Commission, worked for athletes' rights and equality, led the fight for greater women's participation on the IOC board and national Olympic committees, worked for the inclusion of more women's sports events, and continues to fight attempts to use the Olympics for political purposes. But, as Richard Lapchick has written for ESPN.com, her greatest legacy comes from the role model and inspiration she has become and the 2.5 million inner city and disadvantaged children who have benefited from the LA84 Foundation's sporting and fitness programs, from their grants to youth sports organizations, from their educational services, and from the largest sports library in North America. In short, he says, she has opened a world of opportunities by making, then shaping history. In 2005, California First Lady Maria Shriver honored Anita de France with the Minerva Award for transcending great personal challenges to demonstrate indisputable humanitarian qualifications and great enduring acts of service. This is fitting, for in the 30 years since her challenge to the boycott, Anita de France has become much more than a pioneering Olympic official. She has become an ambassador for humanity. Athletes' rights are at the center of what I do, just as individual rights are at the center of what I do in my own country. Once I had come to live in the Olympic Village, it made me recognize that the world could live like this. The world could be at peace.